Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Mark Bostridge, whose previous books include a life of Vera Britton. For his latest book, Mark has chosen an icon of Victorian England with few parallels, Florence Nightingale. So much of an icon was she, that when Lytton Strait she came to write his eminent Victorians, debunking Victorian values in the early 20th century, the lady with the lamp was the only woman among his subjects. But Mark Bostridge's book shows that the later encrustations of legend, and even hagiography, shouldn't blind us to Nightingale's very real achievements, which we discuss later in this interview. I began, though, by asking him how he came to write the book in the first place. Well, I suppose because when I was an undergraduate at university, I'd read S.B. Smith's 1982 book on Florence Nightingale, which isn't a biography, but it's a short debunking study which tore into her and accused her of being a bully, a fantasist and a liar. And in the years since that book appeared, there's been a lot of controversy about whether his accusations were true. And I knew that there hadn't been a major biography, a full-length biography of Florence Nightingale since 1950, when Seth Wooden Smith's famous book appeared. And so I knew that there was very much a need for a, a biography that would go back to the primary sources. But of course, it's such an enormous task. And even though my book is quite a long book, one could have done easily if filled another volume. The, the primary material is voluminous. And so it's really, my book is really an attempt as we draw close to Nightingale's centenary year, which is next year, the centenary of her death uh, in mm. 1910 is really to try and sort of assert some measure of balance back into our ideas about Florence Nightingale, who's really one of the most misrepresented and misunderstood people in modern history. Yes, I think you say in the final chapter of your book that there's been a, a pendulum swing. She's, she's gone from being um, saint to villain with, with amazing rapidity over the decades. Yes, I mean, I think it's partly because of the saint idea, the idea that springs from this extraordinary outpouring of adoration during the Crimean War, the whole lady with the lamp myth is, is so compelling and yet it's so very simple. And it was never really overturned in Florence Nightingale's lifetime because she prized her privacy and her seclusion and she believed she could achieve more in public health, in her work for public health, by not countering that myth and, and working in private. So in a way that myth existed for a long time. And it's almost as if in order to overturn the simplicity of the lady with the lamp myth, you have to go to the opposite extreme and construct mm. something else very simple, a sort of, of, a sort of pantomime villain. I wondered if you felt that Lytton Strachey's eminent Victorians had actually done her a service rather than a disservice, because it seemed to me that by portraying her in a more kind of humanized, warts and all critical way, it had actually sort of opened up questions which before had perhaps not been been properly addressed and have sort of taken us beyond the the saintly lady with the lamp image. Um, I think the results of of Lytton Strachey's uh, essay are very mixed. And on the one hand, yes, I think it was going to happen any, anyway. Someone was going to debunk Nightingale uh, after the First World War in the twenties. It would have been unavoidable. I mean, somebody was going to do it, and Lytton Strachey did it beautifully and and wrote so wittily and and cleverly and. The Florence Nightingale essay of the four in Emily Victorians is still, to my mind, the, the one that's most valuable. I mean, it, it does, it's not, it's unlike the Manning, the Gordon, or the Arnold, which are, um, mm. are deeply flawed because they're very, very inaccurate. I mean, they are really just um, cutting icons down to size, whereas the Florence Nightingale one is a much more, he's much more ambivalent about her. He, you can see that he's, he's on the one hand, he's slightly repelled by her, by this sort of love for the human race above love for, for individuals. I mean, on the other hand, he's also extremely attracted by this, this woman of, of dominating will. So on the one hand, I think it, it, it put her into, back into the public sphere sort of almost a decade after her death. But on the other hand, it, it, it did sort of, as James Pope Hennessy, the biographer once said, it did make um, adolescence snigger at her name, this, this connection of, of sex with Florence Nightingale. Um, I think uh, the idea that she, you know, she, she used her sexual power over men um, in a way that, that, that is amusing, I suppose. And it did have an effect on Florence Nightingale's 
public persona. I wanted to ask you a little bit about her family background because she she remained celibate throughout her life, and her relationship with her family was one of the one of the constants or one of the the, the, the key factors, perhaps, in in sort of shaping her her character. Yes, it was, and I, I think it's important to to say that although she was frustrated for many years by her family's refusal to allow her to train as a nurse, she was also at the same time very, very close to her family in lots of ways, and also many of her family, many of her wider family, as well as her immediate family, were drawn into the sort of vortex surrounding her fame and, and actually did a lot of work for her. A lot of her cousins were, were involved in things like the Nightingale Nursing School or, for instance, her, her cousin Hilary illustrated some of the reports that Florence Nightingale later produced. One of the things I was keen to do was to try and, again, assert a measure of balance in the depiction of the family because it's wrong to say that Florence Nightingale hated her family and, um, you know, was was totally thwarted by them. In fact, one of the most extraordinary and, to me, moving documents I found, which hadn't been uh, published before, was a letter from her mother when Florence Nightingale was trying to, to go to Germany to train as a nurse before the Crimean War, in which her mother is obviously trying very hard to understand her daughter, this hurricane in the house, as someone once said. To have a genius in your family is obviously not something that's easy to, to live with. And, and one of the things that I thought was extraordinary was that her family obviously did try very hard to understand Florence Nightingale, but obviously at times it, it brought great distress to all of them. I found it fascinating what you wrote about her relationship with her older sister, Pathenope. Yeah. She was one year older than her. And her sister kind of has sort of, I think you described it as a mono, monomania, this, yeah. this sort of sense of living her life perpetually in, in relation to her sister and what her sister was doing and thinking and saying. Yes, I think for, for a long period, Pathenope did that. And if you go to Claydon, to the archive that was actually set up by Parthenope after she married Sir Harry Verney in 1858 and look at the paintings and drawings that Parthenope did because she was quite a talented artist as well as a talented writer. They're all, most of them, uh, the bulk of them, are, are pictures of Florence Nightingale as a young woman and when she's slightly older. There is this kind of absolute fixation, obsession with her sister, which rises to a, a climax just before the outbreak of the Crimean War when Parthenope actually has, a, has a, a nervous breakdown when she's back mm. in Scotland because she simply can't cope with the idea that Florence Nightingale is going to break away from home and leave her. And of course, in a sense, as Florence Nightingale recognized, Parthenope was as trapped inside a gilded cage as, as Florence was. And one of the things I hope I've done is to be fairer to Parthenope than previous writers have been and, mm. and to have shown the extent to which Parthenope blossomed after she escaped from home, after she, she married, became the wife of Harry Verney, moved to Claydon to this extraordinary house, and now, of course, owned by the National Trust, which she helped put back together again. And she became a writer, um, and she was also very important in, in spreading Florence Nightingale's own fame. 